to week three. So today we start our exploration of random effects models in specific, and we're going to start with the most basic random effects model, which we're going to call a variance components model, um, mostly because we're going to break out the variance components, uh, that epsilon that we've been talking about and I've been promising you we're going to spend more time on. Today it's all about splitting out the epsilon. Uh, in the future, we're going to call this a random intercept model, and there's no difference between the variance component that we're going to identify today and a random intercept. But the idea of variance components is that we're keeping the model very simple. There'll be no coefficients in our model. There'll be no other variables in our model except the dependent variable and the variance components that we identify. So this is a little bit of a challenging day. Um, it sets the foundation for the rest of the semester, and um, I think that we will have lots to talk about on Friday. All right, so this is a picture you've seen before. And I told you, I promised you, that this picture basically explains the entire course. And so today I'm going to demonstrate that I was correct in that, that this bit picture basically represents the entire course. Now here we have taken our, our data, which we are measuring something across a group. So we've, we've measured salary or weight. Let's just stick with weight for now. So we're measuring weight and we're separating weight into two different means. The male mean represented by x equals 1 and the female mean represented by x equals 0. And we have individuals, we have a mean, right? So y1 up here is the male mean, that's that line there, and y not, y0, is the female mean, right? But all females do not weigh the mean, right? They vary around the mean, and all males do not weigh the same as the mean. They vary around the mean too. But we've gained some information. So here's the global mean, right? Here's the mean of all the people in our sample, and we say, okay, knowing something about gender tells us some information. So here's the male mean, here's the female mean. We have a variance between the male mean and the grand mean, and the female mean and the grand mean. And then we have, so that's the model variance, that's the, model, the, the, the mean squared uh, error of the model term. But we also have variability around, the males all have variability around the male mean, and that's represented by our residual term here, our, our sum of squares error. And all the females have variability around the female mean, right? So we've just split the variability between the model mean implied by the difference between the group means and the grand mean, right? That's this. And then we have the residual within each group around their own mean, so females have their own residual around their mean, and males have their residual around their mean. We're going to continue this theme today, but instead of thinking about groups like gender, we're going to think about clusters or those nested units. So we talked about this a little bit last week around cluster data. What is cluster data? And this is obviously what we're spending our class on. Um, so how we deal with these questions of clusters. So here we have two types of clusters. There's the cross-sectional data and the longitudinal data. So the first, the lab number one, dealt with cross-sectional data. Lab number two is dealing with longitudinal data. So we've, we've explored both of these. Both of these represent clusters where we have some unit. In this case, let's say the Patel is a father of Rod and Mel. Jones is a, is a parent of Tom and Jim. Smith is a parent of Sam and Pat, right? So there's a family component. Um, I'm sorry, maybe these are just family names, right? They don't have to be parents. Um, and then there are children, and you would assume that within each cluster, these children, Tom and Jim, are more similar than Mel is to Tom. Because Mel and Rod are in the same family, ostensibly they have some family-related connection that drives them. So they have socioeconomic status that's the same. They have um, parents that mess them up in the same ways. They have uh, um, you know, a certain aesthetic that they have. They have expectations of the world. They might share religion, right? The list goes on and on and on things that they could share where Rod and Mel are going to be more similar than Tom and Jim, uh, and then Tom and Mel, for example. All right. So obviously, if we move to within person or longitudinal data, and it doesn't, longitudinal data doesn't have to be within person, right? You could measure anything over time, but the thing itself is measured repeatedly. So Eric here is measured at occasions two and three, Susan at one and three, John at one and two, and you would expect John to be more similar 
here at one versus two than John at one is with Susan at three. John and Susan may have nothing to do with one another, have no shared whatevers, and uh, whatever your dependent variable is, but John is certainly going to be related to himself, right? And Susan is going to be related to herself. And so that shared variance, what we want to do is split it between, we want Eric to have variance, and then we're going to recognize that Eric is not the same person at time two as time three, but he's going to be much more similar to himself at two to three than Susan is with Eric. And so Eric to Susan is between person variance. Susan within herself, the difference between Susan at time one and time three is the within person variance. So we're going to split the between subject variability from the within subject variability, which is, as you will note, the same thing we did here. We split the between subject variability from the within subject variability, and we're going to continue that today. So what we're talking about here, what the example we're going to use all day is a very simple example, and I just wanted to give you a little brief description of the data for those of us that are not health professionals. Um, so we all breathe, right? You're probably familiar with breathing. And there's a way you can measure the uh, your, your breathing quality by something called a peak flow measure. And there's a tool called a right met meter, which measures your, your um, the flow of your breath, something of that nature. Um, so here we have a, um, we've developed a new tool called the mini right peak flow meter, and we want to see how good it is related uh, relative to the right, the old-fashioned right mo uh, peak flow meter. Uh, and so we have two measures, right? And we have a measure, we have for each, for each of these tools, for the mini and for the right, we have two measures. We have occasion one and occasion two. So we've measured each person four times, twice with the mini right meter, twice with the right meter. Um, what we want to know is how much of the variance is between subjects, which is incidentally reliability, that's a, that's a measure of reliability, versus within subjects, which in the measurement context we'd call measurement error, right? So, so we, want to, we want to have a sense of how well these tools are performing, and in essence we're going to ask what's the reliability of the mini right versus the right flow measure. Here we have a picture of what the data looks like. And what you can see here is that persons, right? So person one over here, they were measured and the, their measurements are pretty close, not surprisingly. We are measuring something in a person, right? And so there's a little bit of variability. Maybe they were catching their breath at the second one and so their flow is a little lower. But, you know, basically they're the same for almost all, like this one is just totally overlapping. Some of them are a little bit wider, right there number seven is a little bit wider but you know number what is that five is completely indistinguishable um, number 10 is really close number 11 is really close number 15 is really close number 17 is really close so there's a lot of similarity and just by looking at this picture we should be able to see a number of things by the end of this lecture we will have technical terms for what these things mean but it looks like there's a lot more variability between persons than within persons. Would you agree? Between persons, there's a lot more variability than within persons. Now, this person has quite a bit of between within person variability, but everybody else is really, really close. They're, they're occasion one and occasion two measures. So. Already looking at this, what we should see when we model this is we should see that as we split the variance from between to within, we should see a lot more of the variance between persons than within persons. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to do here. So if we want to predict occasion two, would it be better to use the population mean? Right, so that's yij there. Right, so that the mean of yij, which we're going to estimate with an intercept, right, and then an error term. And, and I'm, I'm calling it uh, psi here, but it's going to end up, but that, that's the same thing as our old-fashioned epsilon that we've been using to describe errors in our old-fashioned old regression, right? That's just the residual. So we have a mean and then a residual term. Is that the best way to estimate this data? Or would it be better 
and, and if you don't know the answer to this question, you're taking the wrong class, uh, would it be, uh, right, so the, the, you know, the standard assumptions apply, right? They're uncorrelated over subjects and occasions. Or would it be better to use the subject's occasion one response and, and use that as the prediction? And that's essentially what this model is, where we allow each person to have their own mean we have the variability around their mean, and then we have a grand mean. So we have the grand mean, the population mean. We then have an individual deviation from that population mean. And then we have variability around those individual observations. Now, I just want to note here that we've, we've done some stuff. We've, 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 we've moved from our old model to a new model and we've created some new terms. So this psi here, psi ij, and, and um, I, I wanna be clear, today is the day we have to really start paying attention to these subscripts. These subscripts down here, the i and the j, are gonna tell the story. Um, and, and for a lot of the models that we, we are gonna use, we have to pay attention to which subscript is used because that's, that's gonna tell us what level of the data we're at. So here, uh, with, with psi ij, those are just the deviations around the population mean. So we took a mean of all of the person's right flow meter observations. We just put them all in and we just calculated the mean, right? And then each individual observation, person occasion one, person occasion two, person two occasion one, person two occasion two, et cetera, down to the last person, right? All of our observations, I think there's 17 observations in the data set, and each of those observations, in each of the, 17 persons in the data set, and each of those observations have, each of those persons have two observations, right? Um, so all of, the, all of that data uh, has a deviation from the population mean, and that's the old model that we worked with. But now we've split it into two different components. We have the group deviations from the population means, which is which we're going to refer to as zeta sub j. Now notice there's just a j, there's no i there, and that's because we're only talking about the group. So now there's a zeta for person one, a zeta for person two, a zeta for person three, and those just represent the mean of that person. We're going to also call this a random intercept. So we're allowing each person to have their own intercept. The random piece we'll talk about in a second. But then within each person, within the groups, there's deviation. And this is what we're going to call a level one residual. And this is our old friend epsilon. This is the error term. But now it's not epsilon. It's not the deviation from the grand mean. It's deviation from the group mean. So we've added a group mean, which is what we're going to call a random intercept. All right. So here's a picture of what we've done. We've, we've taken psi, and we've, which, which we could have called epsilon, but for, for obvious reasons, we're not calling it epsilon here. Uh, and we're going to split that into a zeta sub j, right? And that's just at the group. That's what the j is for. There's no i there. Note the subscript. And an epsilon ij, right? So that's, that's, with it, that's uh, occasion one for person one, occasion two for person one. So the i would be the occasion and the j would be the subject number, the person ID. You can see the picture here of what we've done, right? So here's the grand mean, beta down at the bottom. And then we've taken the person mean, zeta sub j, and that is the variability between the grand mean for uh, a, a between people. So that's the between person this is the, be, the variability of the zetas, right? Those, we're going to get a variance term for the zetas. The mean of the zetas is always going to be zero because they represent deviations around the mean, which always just functionally, you know, like everything, the mean is a function of each individual observation divided by the total number, right? So it's going to, the zetas are in, in just mathematically going to have to be a mean of zero, but we're going to calculate a variance of that. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then within each group within each person we have two observations and the deviation between the person mean and the individual observation are our epsilons so all we've done is taken the old-fashioned residual and split it by taking the person mean and then having deviations around that person mean and we're going to get variance for each of these now again the mean of, of epsilon is going to be zero because the the mean represents the space right in between these two right it's in the middle so this subtracting 
this out has to be zero. But we're going to calculate a variance, and thus the variance components. We're going to have a variance for zeta and a variance for epsilon. All right, another way to look at this. This is for you folks that have taken structural equation modeling, a structural equation model, where we have a person mean subject for subject j, and that's zeta. And then we have two observations. We fix the coefficient to be 1. And we then allow each of these to deviate in a certain amount from the, from the observed value, right? So we can, we can know what the value of y2 is by taking the mean, the value of zeta, and adding in the epsilon. That gets us back to our y2. So there's two components in y. Um, and again, this is just this, a, a, a very, very simple regression model. Um, now, one thing you'll note is that the, there's no arrow between these two, and you, you might not note this because you might not have taken a structural equation model, but if we had an, a curved arrow here connecting epsilon uh, 1j and epsilon 2j, that would suggest that they're allowed to be correlated. But the absence of arrow means that they're not correlated. And, and this is an important piece of this. We still have our independence and identically distributed assumption. We've just, and it's still with the epsilons, <laughs> but we've added this other component that it's conditioned on zeta. So if you know zeta, now all of our y observations are independent. There's no correlation between the y observations conditioned on zeta. And then we will add betas to this. So we'll add value, you know, we'll add things to our model. But again, that is the identically distributed and independent piece that we have always dealt with with regression. The, the thing here now is that we have this zeta and we're conditioning on the zeta. So conditioned on the group mean, the epsilons are uncorrelated. And that's, again, we, we've always lived with that assumption with regression. It's just we didn't have group means. So we've just added a group mean. All right. As you know, I like pictures. Let's move to the next picture. And here we have the exact same thing, but with the data, right? So our, our zeta is this mean up here. So the difference between the grand mean and the group mean is zeta. The epsilons represent the difference here between the group mean, uh, the, between the, the, um, the group mean, so the mean for person, was that six? The mean for person six and the occasion number, occasion number one and occasion number two, right? So the epsilons are the difference between the occasions and the mean for person six. The zeta is the difference between the mean for person six and the group mean. Simple equation here. I know that it gets confusing, but we have a very simple linear equation. We have our value, so that's each of these observations, right? Each of these dots is our y, i, j. And we're gonna, we're gonna model, we can, re, we, we can capture this value of y, i, j by knowing what the overall mean is, and that's our beta here, right? So that's the group mean, the intercept, if you will, plus the zeta, J, just a J, right? Because it's at the group level and we don't have an, in, it's not the individual observations. It's just the group mean. So that's this line right here, this dotted line right here. That's our zeta uh, J. Actually, I, I, I should change this. That's J equals six. And then we can, uh, because we have an I here, right? So we need to know what the individual deviations from that group mean are. And so we can capture uh, we can capture the value for y1, 6, right? So observation 1, person 6, by the group mean plus the, um, the grand mean plus the group mean plus the deviation, this value, this bit right here, and that gives us our y value. So that's, that is, this statement means what it says. yij is equal to the grand mean plus zeta, which is the group mean, plus the individual deviation from the group mean for each observation. All right, let's move forward. So I, I, I know I'm repeating myself here, but 
the old fashioned model where we just had the, the intercept and the error term, right? Which is just a mean. That's the same mean that we've been looking at the entire class, right? We started the class looking at means. I told you we can, we can model a mean by in this linear equation format, which you totally believed because you've done it before and we're doing it here, right? So we're, we're, we've got the, the group mean, the, the population mean, and then a deviation of each of the observations around that population mean. And all we've done here is added this term, which is our group mean. So now we have the intercept, the, which is the population mean. We have the group mean, that's just the J here. And then we have the individual deviations around the group mean. So we've split our deviations around the grand mean or the error around the grand mean into a group mean and then deviations from individual observations within the group around a group mean. And that's all we've done here. So the zeta sub j is often what we call the random intercept. Um, now, I'm going to say something, and it's going to be something you're going to struggle with the entire class. We, we will talk today about how to cap, how to get the zeta sub j's or the zetas, right? We'll talk about how to get the random intercepts, but most of the time we don't see the random intercept. What we see is the variance of the random intercept. When we look at the output of our models, we're generally not going to see the zetas. We're going to see the variance of zeta, and that's what we're going to look at. The variance of zeta is called psi, um, and so the psi's are what we're going to see in our output. Uh, that is the variance of these zeta sub j. So the variability be, uh, w between groups is going to be what is captured by the variability of the zeta sub j. So how different are the groups from the grand, the group means from the grand mean? That difference, right, is the variability that we're going to capture in this term that we'll call psi. Um, and it's the between subject heterogeneity. How much difference is there between subjects is here. The epsilon sub ij, right? So now, now we're at the individual observations for each group and the deviations between the individual observation and the group mean is what's captured here. This we're gonna use, we're gonna use, call the variance of that term theta. Now, no, when we estimate things, we estimate a mean and when we estimate things assuming a normal distribution, which everything today assumes. Um, we have a mean and a variance, right? Well, the mean is zero for both of these because they represent deviations. So this represents deviations around this, right? So by virtue of being uh, a, this being the mean within group and this being the total mean, like you work out the math and this has to be, the mean has to be zero for this. Um, as, as has always been the case with residuals, they, they always have to be zero. Um, and then this mean is going to, of course, be zero because this is the deviation around this. So all we're going to get are the variance terms here. And the variance of epsilon ij is what we're going to call theta. And that represents the within subject heterogeneity. So we've split. We're going to have a measure of the between subject heter heterogeneity and then a measure of the within subject heterogeneity. All right. So zeta is going to have a variance of psi, and epsilon is going to have a variance of theta. Now, we're going to need to step out of these wonderful Greek letters and theoretical constructs and talk about a practical issue at this point. In the past, you have never, you have, some of you have, because I've talked to you about this, but in general, you probably have never thought about the format of your data, how it's structured. Um, but here we're going to have to because we're going to need to use what is called long format. And often your data comes in wide format. Um, now, some, some applications like M+, which no one here is using, they can, you can use wide format with M+. Um, but almost all of the other applications, SAS, R, Stata certainly, um, uses the uh, wide format. So this is what our data looks like. So we have individual observations and we have the right the right flow meter uh, occasion one, right flow meter occasion two, many right occasion one, many right occasion two, right? But these guys, many right one and two, and right one and two, are, we, we can't have them spread out long wise like this. So this is, um, I'm sorry, wide, wide, wide wise. This is the wide format um, because they're spaced next to each other in columns. What we need to do is have them stacked so that we have person one, 
for occasion one and then person one for occasion two. And that's what we have down here. This data is in long format. So you'll notice this 494 gets put on top of this 490 or this 490 gets stuck underneath this 494, right? And that's what happens here. So then we've created another variable called occasion, which marks the occasion, which allows us to know the difference, right? So here we have occasion one on the end of the variable name and occasion two on the end of the variable name. But here we need to stack them. Now, a point of clarification in Stata, it's very useful to have these numbers at the end of our observation. So if you're measuring a person at occasion one, occasion two, occasion three, let's say you're measuring somebody using the CESD, which is an oppression measure, and so you would and you measure them at three occasions. I would label them CESD one, CESD two, CESD three when I enter them into my data, and then I would use this reshape command. Um, where I specify what the ID, ID is, right? And so this marks the person, and that's my I. And then occasion J. Now, you'll notice this is very confusing because this is the exact opposite of how I've done it in the, um, <laughs> in the formula. Um, I should change that, but it doesn't matter. We have a person ID, and um, so that ID name is whatever you call your ID. And then occasion is what we're gonna call this variable. And so it's going to strip off this one at the end here and use that there and strip off this two and use that there. But we're going to we're going to have to make sure our data is in the right format because we need observations in the long format, not the wide format. All right, so I'll come back to that in a second, but let's let's go over to Stata. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab some data from the web. And then, um, ooh, you know what I can do is I can change this right here. What did we say? It was six, seven, six. I think it was observation six. Um, so that's the that's that picture that I showed you. Um, so we are going to uh, convert the data from long to wide. And uh, let me just show you what the data look like here, right? So here we have the data in that structured format that we talked about. Was that's the wide format. So this is so uh, right meter one and uh, right meter observation one, right meter observation two are next to one another and they're wide, spread out wide, and we're going to stack them on top of each other. And we're going to do the same thing with right with the mini right meter one observation and the mini right meter two observation. And we're going to do that by using this command here. And see now what happens to our data is it's stacked on top of each other. You saw that? Awesome. Okay. There we go. All right. So, um, there are multiple ways to do this in Stata. Um, and frankly, in R and SAS, there's, there's multiple ways to run random intercept models. Um, one that we're going to come back to when we talk about fixed effect is XTREG. And the first thing we need to do is tell it that it's a um, that it's a nested data set, and so we're going to say that these are clustered at the ID, and that's called XT set. Um, it, everything requires you to to say it somewhere. Stata just wants you to say it first. Um, here, you don't have to do it when we get to mix. We'll, I'll show you how to do it in a second. But uh, we estimate it, and we'll talk about this in a second. All we have is an intercept, and then we have this stuff down here, and we'll talk about what this stuff means. Um, I'm going to mostly, we're going to use mixed in this class. Um, there's a few Stata commands that get us there. This incidentally is the exact same model as this. There's some differences. Let's go back over to uh, the PowerPoint where I have both of these models spread out. Now, um, here, one thing that you need to pay attention to is we've got variance and we've got standard deviations. Variance and standard deviations are the same thing. They're just transformed differently, right? Like one is one is just the square root of the other or the square of the other, depending on which way you're going. So here we have sigmas, which are standard deviations. Here we have variances, which are um, which are the which are the square of the standard of this standard deviation, right? Um, so there, these values are actually the same. If you if you use a calculator and square this or take the square root of this, you'll get these other values. Um, so 
here we have the components that we talked about. We have split the variance. So here's our grand mean, which we've looked at before. This is the average across all of the observations, irrespective of the person. Um, right? We haven't we haven't uh, we we're going to consider the group we're, we're going to consider the group mean, but only in the variance sense. But this is the grand mean here, and then here we have the variability between persons. That's our psi. And here we have the variability within persons. That's our theta. Now, if you recall, when I mentioned that when we looked at the picture, the graph of the data, what we saw is that most of the variability was between persons, not within persons. And that's what we see here. Most of the variability is between persons, not within persons. So there's less variability within persons than between persons. Um, so we have the grand mean, this is our beta, this is our intercept. And we have variance around our zetas and variance around our epsilons, which we are calling psi and theta. We do not see any zetas or, or epsilons here. What we do see though is the variance around our zetas and the variance around our epsilons. And these are our variance components. We've taken the total variability and we split it to between person variability, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, and within person variability. Again, we are repeating ourselves from the first day forward. Um, I, I know that I keep saying that as if it's super easy, but, um, <laughs> but it's not. It's confusing. Uh, and just be patient with yourself. Okay. So, when, when, when I set up the model in the beginning, I said, is it better to use the group mean or is it better to use the individual mean? And we haven't really answered that question because you'll notice there, there's a confidence interval, but there's no p-test for this, right? And, and generally, you don't, the, the, the distribution of error of variance is not normal. Um, it is the variance of a normal distribution, but the distribution of variance is, is not normal. It's, they're, they're weird distributions. Um, so, uh, you know, the confidence intervals will tell us something, right? The, in particular, if this psi gets close to zero, then you, you're sort of pushing, you're, you're going to run into estimation problems because variance, variances do not want to be zero. Um, they, they certainly can't be negative, right? <laughs> and so because of the way the estimation works, it wants to toggle back and forth around a, a, an estimated mean. And if it, if it gets too close to zero, then it needs to get a negative variance. And that's bad, bad news. And your model will not, will, will have estimation problems. And you'll see that if that, if that, if you try to estimate a model with a group variance that wants to be zero or below zero. Um, but here we, we clearly have a non-zero group variance. Um, and so what we, um, what we're, but we want to test, we want to test whether adding this variance component is a statistically significant improvement. And we're going to do that. Uh, so we're testing, is this equation, the top equation here, equivalent to the bottom equation? Or does adding the zeta ij matter, right? Because like these terms, the psi here and the epsilon here, those are, those are functionally the same. Um, the betas are functionally the same. So what we've added here is, uh, is the group mean. Does adding the group mean and allowing for the variability of the group mean, does that help us improve the fit of our model? And we're going to do that using a likelihood ratio test. Um, it's a way we can get a test in Stata. It's really simple. Uh, we, we run the model, right? And this is our mixed model. So um, we don't have to have quietly here. That's just telling it, that just told Stata not to put the output out. So, but the command is mixed. This is our dependent variable, the mini right meter score, and then these two bars, and then ID is the name is ID, right? It, if I had if I called it person ID, I would put person ID here, and if I called it state ID, it would be state ID. So whatever my group variable is, that is the same within group and different between groups. Um, that is all that we've got here. So we've got the dependent variable and the designation that we're going to separate out the variance by this group. So we're going to calculate group means for ID. MLE is just maximum likelihood estimation. There's two forms of estimation, REML and maximum likelihood. Each of the programs, I think, runs a slightly different, um, has a different um, default in Stata. It, the default is MLE, I believe, in SAS and R. The default is REML. 
R M L E. Um, you can call either in either. There's very trivial differences. Um, Remmel just assumes just um, adjusts the degrees of freedom for recognition that we're calculating a grand mean, whereas maximum likely it doesn't. So it's a slightly more conservative, and there's some reasons why you'd want to choose one versus the other. The book describes that, and it's not particularly important. So we estimate the model. We then store those estimates. Estimate store ri, and that's the name. Ri is just the name I given it. I've given it. And then I run the same model, but without the group variability. So again, I'm running this model first, and then this model, because these models are nested. So this model here is nested within this model. This model, if we, if we assume that this is zero, which is the statistical test that we're making here, right? We're assuming that this is zero. That's the null hypothesis. If this, the, the variability around zetas is truly zero, then these models are totally equivalent because this term factors out at zero. So we test that and it turns out, nope, that is a very unlikely, this, we are not likely to get this difference in likelihood ratio, in, in, which ends up being a chi-squared with two degrees of, or with one degree of freedom because there's only one parameter difference. Um, that's not a likely explanation. So that suggests that adding this term statistically improves the model. Um, in R, you can use the ANOVA function after you run multiple, um, when you save as objects, different, um, different models. So you would run the two models. You would have model one, model two, just like we did here uh, using L LME4. And then you would use uh, the ANOVA command, which is just simply ANOVA model one, comma model two. In SAS, there's a macro called mac, uh, mixed fit, which does the estimation. But in all of these, you can actually, um, you can actually get the value. So here's the log likelihood value here. Um, so if we just do this, so let's get rid of quietly here. So if we just do this, and we're, we're running that model, right? And then we're going to run this model. And you see the log likelihood value right here and the log likelihood value right here. So we would just do two times the difference in log likelihood value. Uh, let's see this model. Minus this model, where, where are you, log likelihood value, see that 46, that's our chi-squared value with one degree of freedom, and it's one degree of freedom because here we have variance residual, here we have variance residual, here we have constant, here we have constant, what we don't have is this psi, right, so that's our psi right there, so that's our epsilon, that's our psi, that's our beta. The difference between these two is that one has a psi, one doesn't, right, as we talked about before. You'll notice 46.27, 46.27. So that's, we just, two times the difference in log likelihood values. Um, for SAS users, I will note that SAS gives you two times the log likelihood value, minus two times the log likelihood value. So. Um, you don't need to do the times two. You just take the difference between the two times the log likelihood values, and that then is your chi-square statistic. And then you can just get the chi-square distribution for this. And I don't, I don't know the state of command offhand, but all of the applications have a way of doing that. And you can, you can go back to the old tables and look them up in a book if you want. Um, okay. So what we've done so far is we've taken our mean. We've split our mean into a group mean and a and a, grant, a population mean and a group mean, and then we have the residual around the group mean, and that's how we can recapture each individual observation. We've tested whether that improves the fit of the model, and it does. The the negative the the p value, the extremely low p value here, suggests that adding that variance component, allowing individuals to vary between each other, in addition to within themselves is a better model than just looking at each of the observations compared to the group mean. So adding the adding um, the grant the population mean. So adding the group means to the population means improves the model. Now we could have we knew that by looking at the picture. It was pretty clear that that was going to be the case. 
Um, but how big is that? How how much variability is there between the groups uh, versus within the groups? And this is what we call interclass correlation. The interclass correlation is a very simple construct. It is the between cluster correlation. How much correlation is there between clusters? How much correlation is there within clusters? Now, if you just think, through, so the formula here is psi, the between group variance, over the total variability, psi plus theta, because we split the variance into psi and theta. And so that's 100% of the variance. That's all, you know, if you go back and you, and you were to look at, you, if you were to take our data um, and calculate the um, mean and variance of that data, the variance would be the psi plus the theta. We've just split the variance around our yijs um, into two components. The variability around uh, the estimated mean per group and then the variability within those groups around that mean, right? So we've just split the variance into with between group variance and within group variance. And this is the ratio of between group variance to total variance. So that's just a that's just a percentage. How much variability is between the groups? How much variability is within the groups? Now looking thinking about our model, right? So where we have, and this is this this is a repeated theme. When you have longitudinal data, which is essentially what we have here, longitudinal data, and we're looking at persons over time. Persons are really similar to themselves, and most of the difference is between people, not within persons. So in that case, you would have a very high interclass correlation because this number is going to be the majority of this number, right? And that we're just dividing here, right? This is just a fraction. So a, a lot of the variability is going to be between people because people are very similar to themselves. Now, if we're looking at something like, you know, values across states, or if we're looking at cross-sectional data, um, where, where what we're comparing, you know, um, this happens a lot in geography, where there's very little of the variance is between clusters, and a lot of the variance is within clusters. So if we're looking at people nested in geography, the people are still mostly going to be different from each other. And there's, there's a small amount of the proportion of the variance. So you're going to have low interclass correlations in that case when this number is small relative to this number. But when this number is large relative to this number, and this whole number, um, then you're going to have a higher interclass correlation. And here, we're going to have a high interclass correlation because most of the variability is between people, much less of the variability is within people. I will note that these are not the same as Pearson correlations. Um, they're, they're different things totally. Uh, this formula, if you want to stare at this for a while, you can see that those are not the same thing. Um, but, um, but so it's a different kind of correlation. Um, but it is like, like Pearson correlations bounded between zero and one. If this number is really small, a, a vanishingly small, this number will approach zero. If this number is large relative to this number, this number will approach one, but it should never exceed one or go below zero. So it's bounded between one and zero. So what I have here is a picture of two different, um, two different data sets, one with high interclass correlation and one with low interclass correlation. And unfortunately, I put the the answer to my question. But see if you can see why one group, and think through, look at these pictures for a while. Why is one group designated as a high interclass correlation and one group as a low interclass correlation? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be silent for a second and then I'm gonna resume talking, but you should hit pause. All right, so the High interclass correlation is because the variability is between these means. There's not a whole lot of variability within the group. The tightness around the mean here mean that when we split the variance between the variability, which we're going to call psi, between each of these, these means, which are these straight lines, and the grand mean, so each of the group means to the grand mean, Right, all of those numbers, 
are where most of the variability is. Once, we, once we've adjusted for that, conditioning on these means, and now we're just looking at the variability around those means here, there's not much there. These are really tight, right? Here, on the other hand, there's a lot more variability around the mean. So a lot more of our variance is in theta relative to psi. And that's going to lower the interclass correlation because the value, right? So when this number gets bigger relative to this number, this ratio is going to get smaller. When this number is bigger relative to this number, this ratio is going to get larger. So if more of the variance is between, we're going to have a high interclass correlation. When more of the variance is within, we're going to have a lower interclass correlation. So there's more variability within each of these groups. So that's going to be a lower interclass correlation because there's less variability within the group and more variability between the group. There's higher interclass correlation here. All right. That's going to take some time to think through. Uh, you want to practice that and you want to look at these pictures until you can, can look at them and be like, yes, low, yes, high, and, and get that sense. Okay. So I've been using this term random effect, um, which is in contrast to fixed, fixed effects. Um, so let me, let me start by demystifying fixed effects. You've always done fixed effects regression. You've only interacted with one random effect, and that is the epsilon ij or the epsilon i, your, your, your error terms, the, the error terms, which we've referred to in words like stostatic or, um, or we, we describe you know, how we'll always have a mean zero and a variance, or we'll think about it as a variance component, uh, or with, you know, we'll, we'll think about the variability, the, the root mean squared error. We've been talking about that, right? The variability of this thing right here. That is a clue that this is a random effect. Um, but all of the other models you've run in probably in your entire life have included this random effect and these fixed effects. Why are they called fixed effects? Well, that's because we think of them as a thing, right? There is a mean to these things. So there's a grand mean, there's individual, there's, you know, we have coefficients, so the mean for male, female, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when we, when we move to a system where we're looking at the clusters, and so this is the model over here that we've been dealing with today. I told you that this is a random effect, that we will never see the actual, we, we, will, we will actually today see them, um, and you can get them, but we, we generally don't look at the zetas. We look at the psi, which is the variability around zetas, right? That, the fact that we're looking at the variability around the zetas rather than the zetas themselves tell you that that's a random effect, which is the same thing we do with the residuals. Like you can see the residuals, but mostly we just think of the residuals in terms of a variance parameter, which the root mean squared error and so that that clues you in that this is a random effect so but we almost never refer to this as a random effect but it but it is um, we refer to this as a random effect here what if we just treated each person as their own thing and didn't think about a population around with a mean zero and a variance what if we just said person one has a mean and person two has a mean and person three has a mean and person four has a mean well, you've done that a whole bunch of times in your life. For example, you, uh, when you calculate, when you do dummy coding for uh, gender or you do dummy coding for uh, race, those are, you th think that there's a mean for black, a mean for white, a mean for uh, Asian, you know, right? There's a mean for male, a mean for female, a mean for um, non-binary gendered. Um, so those are things and we can think of these groups as things. So we could just have a mean for person one and a mean for person two. And this would just be a set of dummy codes where each group would get their own variable. So each, so we had 17 people in our observations. So you would put in 16 means into this. So you'd have 17, right? Cause you have the grand mean, which would then be the person that you left off. And then each of the deviations between that grand mean and the individual observation, just like we do with gender or race or anything else. This is a fixed effects model. So all we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make fixed effects a little bit more complicated in a, in two lectures, I think, or maybe next week. Um, but for now, suffice it to say that the the simple way to think about this is we just have a, a coefficient 
for each person that represents each person. So we'll have a person one variable, a person two variable, a person three variable, a person four variable. And if you think about what these linear equations mean, and that's why we went through and we were we kept figuring out what all of these values were, this would be the, if we leave off person one, right, and then we make them the, the baseline, this would be the mean of person one. And then uh, alpha for person two would be the deviation between person one and person two. Alpha three would be the deviation between person one and person three down the line. And then this would be the with, between, within person variability. But these are just fixed means, right? So that's what a fixed effect is. A random effect is we've assumed that these are drawn from a population with a mean zero and an estimated variance. So here, these are things in themselves. They are things, they are persons. Here, we're assuming it's drawn from a population. And there's gonna be strengths and weaknesses to each of those approaches. And we're gonna talk about that in, in, in toward the end of the semester, we're gonna unify this into one global perspective on doing this. Um, so, so when we talk about fixed effects, I'm gonna call this alpha J. When we talk about a random effect, I'm gonna call this zeta J. And that's just the way we're going to designate it. Um, these are going to be very similar in a lot of ways, but there are some differences, and those differences are somewhat important. Um, and we will spend a lot of time talking about the difference between these two models. Um, but as a, as a, just now, to, because you're curious people, and I don't want to leave you totally hanging on, I'll tell you the answers in the future, um, although it does depend. Um, the rule of thumb here is if you are interested in the specific cluster units. Let's say you have a hundred factories and you want to know which factory is the best because I'm going to give that the factory manager of that factory a bonus. That's a fixed effect. That you you want to know factory 243B is my best factory and factory 243C is really falling down on the job. So I'm going to fire that guy and I'm going to give that guy a raise. That is a fixed effect. You, you want to know the actual cluster specific units. But if you are interested in a population or you want to generalize from your model to a larger group, like does CBT work with people that are depressed? Well, you don't, you know, it's not that you're unconcerned with person one and person two and person three in your study, but in general, what you really want to know is, is CBT effective for treating depression? That is a population-based question. So depending on whether we are interested in individual units and clusters, or if we are interested in um, the population of represented by the clusters that you've sampled from for the clusters, um, then that would be a random effect. Um, the other, there's another piece to this, and there's some, there's, we'll talk about this again in more detail, but if you are interested in understanding effects at the cluster level, you cannot do that with random effect because you've already explained it all. All of the variability is here in the uh, alpha sub j's. Um, here, we can, model, we can model effects at the cluster unit. So if you wanted to know, so for example, if we had persons in our study and we wanted to know, do, do African Americans respond differently than white people to our CBT therapy? We have to use a random effects model because all of that within person variability is captured by this guy, this alpha sub J. Uh, so you can't, you can't, because alpha sub J will be totally collinear with anything else you put at the J level, um, at the unit level, that you, you can't. You can't do that. So um, you can't include cluster level effects and fixed effects estimation. Now there's a flip side to that, which is that this alpha sub j controls for all within person or within cluster things that don't change between with within by the I unit. So for example, if you think longitudinally, if you th anything that's static, non-changing over time that you want to adjust for, all of that is adjusted for this. So that's great if you don't care about the cluster effect. If you only want to deal with the clusters, move that out of the way and look at change over time, then yeah, absolutely. Fixed effects are very useful. But if you're interested in some aspect of the cluster, then you need to use a fixed, so a random effect. So there's a lot of ways in which we're going to, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. That is a very brief introduction to that. All right. Now, I told you that we are not in general going to take a look at the Zetas, but uh, every now and then we're going to look at the Zetas because we might be interested in that for some reason or another. 
and today we're going to talk about how to get those zetas. Um, so we have to estimate the zetas just like we need to estimate our y hats or our epsilons. You know, we, we calculate them using some post estimation command. Um, and we're going to do that here. There are two primary ways that we get zetas. One is with our old friend maximum likelihood, and two is a, a, a new friend, Bayesian estimation. Um, so we're going to spend some time at the very end where I'll talk about Bayesian estimation in general. Um, there, that's a whole separate class, and we're going to be we're going to be living in maximum likelihood here in this class. We're not we're not going to really touch on Bayesian estimation except for a little bit once today, and then at the end again we'll we'll, we'll revisit it. All right, so. Our maximum likelihood estimators of zeta uh, are pretty straightforward. It's the cluster mean of the estimated total residual over the number of observations within each cluster. Right? Simple. The estimated. <laughs> I'm chuckling because that's that's a little it's a little not simple. Um, so remember, the key thing to remember here is that we've taken away the grand mean. We we are looking at the deviations from the group to the grand mean. That's what we're. That's the zeta, right? If you if you think back to our picture that we looked at at the very, if we looked, uh, let me grab the picture for a second. Uh, here we go, right? So what we're looking at is this here, right? So we've already assumed this. We've already assumed beta. So we're taking out. 450 here, right? And we're just taking the difference between this person number six and the grand mean. That's the difference that we're, that's what we're estimating here. Because we've already estimated this line. What we need to do is estimate this difference for this person and this person and that person and that person and that person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let me get back to where I was. Okay. So to do that, we just take the total variability, at, which is the variability, if you recall, between the grand mean and each individual observations, and we divide it by two, which incidentally is what we just saw. That's, that's that line. That's how we would estimate it. We would take each of the deviations between occasion one and occasion two and the grand mean. That's why this is the psi and not the zeta. So ironically, we need to go back to psi to get zeta. So here's our psi 1. So that's the difference between the observation 1 for person J plus the observation 2 for person J, the difference between the observation 2 and the grand mean. I'm sorry, let me say that again. The difference between observation 1 for person J and the grand mean and, the, and added to the difference between observation 2 for person J and the grand mean and then we divide it by half because we've got two observations. If we had three observations, we'd divide by a third, or, or you know, we're just dividing by n, right? So that's that's what this formula makes it more generic here, right? Um, so we just how many observations within cluster? Again, we need to pay attention j, right? So it's not the total n; it's the n within cluster, right? Um, so we're just taking the average. We're just getting the average deviation. The average deviation between individual observations within each group and the grand mean, and that's it. Um, so let me, let me take a little walk over to Stata, and we can do this. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to get our we are going to get our um, model here, right? So uh, I don't want to use XT mixed. I'm just going to use mixed. Um, XT mixed and mixed are the same thing. This just XT mixed is an older one. Um, so we're going to get our um, our model that we've talked about, right? Where we dependent variable, and then we're going to cluster at the ID level, and we're using maximum likelihood estimation. And this is the model that we've been seeing the whole time. We've we've, we've run one model today. I'm going to predict the linear equation, which is this, this guy right there. Um, so, right, you see, 
see that right there? That is our linear equation, which is the intercept. That's all we have in the model, the intercept, and then the, for the linear part, right? And then we have the random effects, and that's where we want to get the random effects. So we take the linear part, and we subtract it from each of the individual observations, right? For occasion one and occasion two, and occasion one and occasion two, and occasion one and occasion two, right? So we're going to get that. Right, so that's really straightforward. Nothing complicated so far. 58 is the difference between the predicted value, which is the, just the grand mean, and the individual observation. 71 is the difference between the predicted value, which is just the grand mean, and the individual observation, so on and so forth. And then we're going to recapture this by um, going back and, and regressing this uh, using these guys using um, I'm sorry not this using this as the as the variable. so we're gonna have 17 we're just gonna take 17 observations which incidentally as you might imagine just takes the average here so we're just taking the average of these that's all we're doing in this regression and now we have the variability around the grand mean so if I wanted to know what is the estimated value for person one, I would go up here and I would take this intercept, right? So that's the grand mean. And then I'm going to add the difference. Oh, there's another trick here. I said no constant. So there's no, there's no constant here, right? There's no intercept here. I forced all of then that 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 means I don't so I have one through seventeen I have no reference group these are all the things in themselves um, and you could always do that if you just have it, it gets problematic but if you just have one variable so if you just wanted to estimate gender the effect of gender and you have male and female and you just want to know what the difference in the means are you can calculate that using this no constant option anyways this gets me a mean for each of the individual options the deviation between the grand mean and the individual observation because I took the grand mean out right that's the subtraction part up here right that's when I subtracted it out so it got rid of the grand mean so these are just the deviations between the grand mean so if I want to capture the average for expected value for person one I just do this right and that's the expected value for person one and if we go look at the data right so we've got 512 and 525 and it said 518 and that would be smack dab in the middle right so that's the estimated value for person one and then the epsilon so that's my zeta 518 this is uh, I'm sorry this is my zeta which represents the difference between person one and the grand mean and uh, putting them all together, this is my expected value for person one. And then we could keep doing that for each individual person. All right. So that is maximum likelihood estimation. We are just taking the deviations around the grand mean and we're averaging them for each person. So it's the average deviation per person around the grand mean. Simple. Now, we almost never do it that way. Um, mostly what we do is we use an empirical Bayes estimation um, because we know some things and that's a prior. And when we have a good prior, we probably want to use it um, because that's information. So Bayes combines the likelihood with the prior to get a posterior. And um, incidentally, uh, just to be clear, uh, Everything in Bayesian estimation is random effects. There's no, there's no fixed effects in Bayesian estimation. It's all random effects. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But suffice it to say here that we're going to take our prior, which I'll tell you what that is in a second, and multiply it by the likelihood. Now, the maximum likelihood, right, is just the likelihood. That's all, that's all this was, right? Like we were just looking at each individual observation conditioned on uh, zeta. Um, that's that's what our model is, right? Our model is only the zetas. That's the only thing we have in our model. We we have a mean and the zetas. That was all we had in our model, right? And so that's the likelihood, which was the same as in maximum likelihood, 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 right? Um, but here we want to calculate the zetas conditioned on the data. That's the posterior. So to do that, 
and this is again beyond, well beyond the scope of this class, uh, we're going to take the prior and we're going to multiply it times the likelihood. Um, the prior is just the normal distribution with a mean zero and an estimated variance of psi. We know what the prior is because the prior is what our belief of the structure of our uh, of our random effect is. And we've already said that. It has a mean zero, which we know is just a function of the of the way the data is calculated, right? You, you have deviations around a, a point and that's always gonna add up to zero, right? That's why we square variance because if you don't square the variance, then <laughs> you get zero. Um, so deviations around a central point are always gonna be zero. So the mean is zero and we have some estimated variance, which we have already estimated. We're gonna call that psi. And so empirical Bayes prediction of zeta is just the mean of the posterior distribution. So we're just going to combine these things, what we already know, or what we believe to be true, with the data and the model. And that's going to give us a posterior distribution. And then we're just going to get the average, the mean of the posterior distribution, plugging in these values. And that's going to give us our zeta. Um, and fortunately, in Stata, um, there's a um, in the book in the Sophia book, um, she walks you through how to get the difference. There's a relationship between the maximum likelihood estimator and the um, and the uh, empirical Bayes estimator, um, which ends up being a factor that's very similar to the to the um, interclass correlation. It's it's the interclass correlation with the theta divided by the number of observations within each group. But suffice it to say, we almost never do that. What we do do, though, is I got to run the model again. Um, eh, interesting, I didn't know that. Um, what we do do, though, is we get our predicted value here by just running EB predict our effects, so random effects. I want it to predict the random effects. And since we only have one random effect here, which is our um, which is our zetas, here we have our zetas. So uh, these are the same, right? So the average between these two numbers would be the EB1. So that's our maximum likelihood estimate is the average of these two guys. Here we, we just we have it estimated so uh, as you'll notice that these are very similar. Um, right. Um, now, one thing that, that Bayes does do, um, and this is a, a value of Bayes, is shrinkage. Um, for those of you um, <laughs> um, So shrinkage is the idea that because we are adding additional information, which is our prior, right, which has a mean zero, we are going to start with that assumption that the data is structured like this. You see this, you see this line right here, the solid thick line right here? That is our assumption of normal distribution with a mean zero and a uh, variance of one, right? Um, now, we have the likelihood, which is the distribution of the data conditioned on zetas. And you see how different those are, right? They're different. The posterior distribution is going to combine those. So in a situation, in here we have low interclass, what is not quite, but functionally low interclass correlation. It's R value, which is that modified interclass correlation. Um, we're going we're gonna to pull back. We're going to shrink the estimate from the data or the likelihood to the prior. And so it pulls it back. When, when we have a high interclass correlation, and also when we have a lot of data relative, if we have a lot of data, the data is going to drive it. So once, once you approach you know, infinity of sample size, there's no difference between the maximum likelihood estimator and the Bayes estimator. Um, but in, in general, in, in real world terms, the Bayes estimator is going to be slightly more conservative and it's going to pull those estimates a little bit further back. And that's the shrinkage because we are adding prior information. We assume that the mean is zero. Um, and so we don't want means to go too far away from zero. Um, and so that's what happens with Bayesian estimation is that it, it, it shrinks a little bit. Um, Suffice it to say, the Bayesian estimator is, in general, the better estimator for most applications. And that's why when you 
estimated in Stata, and this is also true in R, and it's also true in SAS. This is why people use that. In large, in a simple way to think about this is, in our data, we only have two observations, and we're calculating the mean of the de deviation between observation occasion one and occasion two from the grand mean. We only have two observations to calculate the mean. So the mean is going to have more variability than we probably want. Um, we we, we, we want to use other information to, to inform what we think the mean truly is. Um, and that's where the posterior, where the prior comes in, 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 um, in the Bayesian estimation. So if you had, you know, if you were estimating um, a model in which you had the number of people in the state and, you know, each state has, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of people, you know, somewhere between 400,000 and 30 million people in it. Well, the difference between the Bayesian estimator and the maximum likelihood estimator is going to be zero. You have well, well over the number of people needed to get a calculation of the mean. That's just not going to matter. But in situations like we have, where we have two observations per person, using those two observations to calculate the mean is a little bit of an iffy proposition. We would want to use additional information, and that's the posterior. I mean, sorry, that's the prior, which helps informs the posterior. All right. So wrapping up today. We started the day with our old friend OLS regression, and we ended the day with a new data generating process, which includes a random effect, or a random intercept in this case, which we are calling zeta sub j. Here's a picture of what we've done. So if you look at the beta here, the grand mean, right, we assume that the zetas have a distribution around that grand mean. So there's a population mean for something that we're estimating. And then we assume that individuals or units within that vary around that grand mean. And then we assume furthermore, using a normally distributed error, that there's a, a variability around that group mean. So we've taken our one distribution, one normal distribution, and we've turned it into two normal distributions. The random intercept, the distribution around the grand mean for the random intercepts, and the very and the uh, distribution around the group mean for each of the individual observations, and this is where we're spending our semester. We're we're spending our semester here in this graph. All right, I'll talk to you guys on Friday.